All right, welcome to episode 21 of APS Radio. I'm with my very special guest, Mike Dugan. How are you, brother? I'm, How's everything? I'm good. Good. That is, first of all, let's start with, uh, you've got a great mustache going there. I'm trying, huh? I'm trying my best to copy that. I know everybody that's listening to this can't see it, but it looks almost as good. Well, we're getting there. We're getting there. And uh, you got to remember, my mustache got me in trouble. So um, that was a, one of my stories in the FDNY. I got jammed up because my mustache made new turns on my face. <laughs> nice. I'm uh, any day now I'm waiting to be pulled over and said, hey, you got to trim that up. But yeah, I'm going to enjoy while I can. OK, so, uh, you know, huge background you have. I mean, you've done everything, you know, volunteer firefighter. Uh, you were a police officer for a hot minute. Yep. And then, you know, did a whole career, FDNY, retired as a captain not too terribly long ago. Yep. You know, along with that, you know, multiple awards that you've won. You've taught at FDIC. You've got your own show with uh, Mikey G, you know, Mike Galliano, which I don't know why. There's got to be something going on. Why wasn't? Why is it the Mikey G and Mikey D show? Why isn't it the Mikey D and Mikey G show? Because I really don't care. <laughs> okay, ego eats brains. Um, I don't care if they call it those two dumb guys, those two dumb truck captains. It doesn't matter to me. And that's my buddy Mike. We don't have egos. We don't really care. And, you know, it's not like, oh, my God, somebody's got top billing over me or somebody else is teaching a class that I once taught. Oh, my God. No, you know, no, no. I'm just kidding. He's the one that actually put me in touch with you. Yeah, no. And we're great friends. And the, the thing is, um, Mike Galliano and I met uh, when we were um, on the circuit and he was doing the air management stuff and I was doing the truck company stuff. And um, Mikey G was in Seattle, as far removed from New York um, as you can be. And we realized that um, as captains, we were going through some of the same stuff with our individuals, with our people, with our superiors, um, with the civilians, the citizens that we serve. And it was a very interesting thing. And um, at the time I was working, I was heavily involved in the New York City Captain's Management Program, and I was teaching the Captain's Management Program. And Mikey Galliano said to me, oh, I wish we could get in on that. And I said that to the chief who was um, in charge, Chief Burns, I said, listen, I would love to get these guys in there to do this. And he said, well, let me kick it up. I got to kick it up the chain of command. And it went up the chain of command. And because Seattle had helped New York City when they were buying fireboats and had gone out of their way to help us, the brass said from the chief of the department on down said, yes, they can come in. So Mike Galliano and um, his chief at the time, Jesse, oh God, I'm gonna forget his last name. I forget Jesse's last name, forgive me. But Mike and Jesse are the only two outsiders who've ever been through the class. And we put Jesse in as a chief because he was the Seattle chief of training. He was the chief of the fire academy. And we put Mike through as a captain. And it was amazing because it's the same stuff. The same thing is going on. And as we say in the New York City firehouse, and we talk about different firehouses, it's the same circus. The clowns just have different last names. That's so true. That's absolutely true. Well, Mike put me in touch with you because, uh, you know, I do this uh, annual conference in exotic Beaver Creek, Ohio. It's a beautiful place um, every year. And uh, he said, you've got a class that would be great for that because he taught the year before. And uh, I know when we got together, I said, I'd love to have you on this show to kind of just, you know, do a Cliff's Notes version of that class, which is you know, really in your career, you've seen a lot of stuff, a lot of craziness, uh, you know, going to both World Trade Center events, uh, plus everything else that's thrown at you, you know, the fatal fires and everything else. But that, you know, that weighed pretty big on you. And with that, I'll let you just kind of take care of just 
I'll tag you in and you can just kind of tell your story as far as the, the mental aspect of just dealing with so much, just so much. Well, the other thing is, and it, you got to really go back to the beginning. And I go back and before the show, we were talking about Beaver Creek, Ohio, and being near Dayton and the Air Force Museum. And my dad was a World War II bomber pilot. And my dad flew 65 missions in a bomber as a pilot in World War II over hostile territory. And he came back and there was no help. There was no um, PTSD at the time. There was nothing. I mean, there were guys who cracked under the stress and it was called battle fatigue. And I was just reading something about Patton um, striking that guy, calling him a coward who had battle fatigue at the time. And again, my dad came back and went to work for the American Tobacco Company. And the idea there was he had to smoke to have his job because he had to test cigarettes, had to smoke. He had to bring home unmarked cartons of cigarettes and smoke them, tell them what you thought of these cartons of cigarettes. And they came back and he was working in the advertisement. And I don't know if any of your listeners have ever seen the show on TV, Mad Men, but it's a very, very um, good representation of what we, our life was like. You know, drinking was a part of our life. Uh, that's how my dad treated his um, things. And um, I was telling somebody the story a while back and somebody just called me about it. Uh, my father had um, dreams and talked about uh, bombing a, um, they thought it was a troop train, a German troop train. It's POWs. And they didn't know that. And they probably killed Americans. And it just happens. And I was talking to a friend of mine about it. And he said he was watching a show, a friend of mine in Australia the other night we talked, and he said he was watching a show and they said that the Germans used to house either Jewish um, folks on their way to concentration camps or POWs around places. So the Americans would kill them and it was, or the British or whoever was bombing, but they would get killed. So again, I grew up um, in a drinking life and I joined the fire department and drinking was part of being a fireman. And very honestly, um, I still drink occasionally, not as much as I did, um, but I have learned to control it and walk, step away from it if I need to. If I want to go out with my wife and have a glass of wine to celebrate our anniversary or something, that's fine. If we're on vacation, I might have a drink with her. But I don't go out in groups with uh, people and go to conferences and go out with the guys and get drunk because I was doing that and it was becoming an issue for me. So I grew up with drinking being a part of your life joined the fire department, drinking as a part of the fire department. And then I went through a lot. Um, I had one of my uh, fires early on was a thing called Schomburg Plaza. And it was my first real fatal fire. And this um, the woman, she was on the 34th floor and she was uh, burnt to death, horrific. But she forced her three kids out the 34th floor window. And the youngest was 12, 12 year old girl. And we had seven people die on that one. The night before we had a homeless individual in cardboard boxes living there and some kids set the boxes on fire and he died. Um, and um, then we had a guy commit suicide by sticking his head in the oven. So I lost nine people in a 24 hour tour. The next tour I worked, I lost another uh, seven, uh, five in a car accident and two at a fire. And there was no help. There was nothing to do. So what do you do? You drink more, you self-medicate, um, you do all this stuff. Um, I went through um, a lot of stresses and I will talk about them in the class you know, a lot of different fires and I had a lot of fun and I loved going to work, but there were always bad days and the stress 
accumulates, it becomes cumulative. And it's really, really, really bad for us. So what happens is that when the stress gets cumulative, there are problems. Um, my wife had our second child and um, my wife was on life support for 12 days after the baby was born. I thought I was gonna, I gave her permission to go. I said goodbye to my wife. She was given last rites three times. My daughter was born on February 9th. On February um, 14th on Valentine's Day, I was called back to the hospital to say goodbye to my wife. Okay, uh, my wife and I still don't celebrate Valentine's Day. Um, and we both hate the month of February. Um, but it's just the way things go there. So all of these things happen and they add up and stress is cumulative. Uh, I made a rescue at a fire and I made a roof rope rescue and I got the highest medal in the FDNY. I was just doing my job. And I will tell the story about this at the class, but it was very, very interesting. Um, but the horrible part about it, it was two days before Christmas and the father lost his two children in that fire, little kids. It was a Christmas tree fire, the apartment took off the whole nine yards. And the guy, the father was burnt horrifically. He made a push that would have made any fireman in the world proud. So these things, add up. And most people have four or five of these in their lifetime. Firemen can have two to 400 of them in their career and they become cumulative and it adds up. And I went through, you know, normal life. Everything's going good. We're doing everything. I go to the first World Trade Center. I mean, um, I got married. I had little kids, I won the medal. I mean, my wife was pregnant when I won the medal. Um, and they're talking to me about, you know, they're talking, honoring me, telling my wife how I went off the roof of a building on a rope from seven stories up. And I feel these fingernails digging into my hand. And she's like, you're gonna be a dad, you know, you got, honey, it's my job, I gotta do this. So life is good, we're enjoying it. We have a house, we have our dogs, we and my beautiful little girls. I get promoted in 2000 to captain. I got, you know, fireman. I was a fireman in Spanish Harlem in lot of 43. It was a great place. And then I ended up in um, lot of 42 in the South Bronx as a lieutenant. And then I got promoted to captain and I was covering around the uh, 15th division in Brooklyn and just having a great time. And 9-11 happened um, the day before I was at a party on September 10th at the firehouse where I was a lieutenant, uh, 73 and 42 in the South Bronx. And um, I, um, at that party, 11 men, including Father Judge, uh, Chief of Department Pete Gancy, um, First Deputy Commissioner Bill Feehan, were all at this party. And, you know, Ray Murphy, Pete Beafield, these were great guys that I worked with. They were all at this party and they don't see sunset the next day. And um, I was working that day at the fire academy because I had gotten the day before I was supposed to be working. So I'd done what they called a self-mutual. I had gone to, told them I couldn't work that day because I was working the next day at the fire academy on September 11th. So I'm at the fire academy on September 11th and um, a plane hits the World Trade Center. And as everybody thinks about this, we all think, oh man, this is, you know, what idiot Piper Cub crashed into the World Trade Center. And at the time there was only one TV that worked in the fire academy because they didn't want firemen spending their time watching TV. They never thought about news. And um, the next thing you know, we're all in the chief of training's office looking at this and we see the second plane hit. And we're like, we're at war, we gotta go. And we went down there and I got down there when the second tower collapsed. And I saw one of the companies that I worked with because I was in something called an R group, which is relief. So you cover firehouses when they don't have a regularly assigned officer. 
in the city. And one of the companies I saw was uh, Ladder 113, Camp Rogers Rats. Uh, I saw the rats rig on fire in front of the building. And I'm walking up and, you know, we, when we got there on the bus, second tower came down as we were pulling up on the bus. When we got there, the second tower collapsed. And I'm walking up and I see the wheel of a jet, of a plane. You know, you can tell it's the landing gear, the way it's all set up and everything else. And you see this, and next to it is a woman's shoe, not really a high heel, but not a flat, you know, uh, a low heel, I guess you would call it. I don't know what the women call it, to be honest, but with a foot and an ankle in it, but that's it. And I say to some cop, uh, this is evidence. You better watch this stuff. You know, uh, this is part of what's going on. And this told us what we were dealing with, told me what we were dealing with was that. So I'm down there and then I get a call um, about nine o'clock at night. What are you doing? I'm down at, the, at ground zero. Well, you better get home and get a little bit of sleep. You're on duty tomorrow. You have been assigned to a company Tomorrow morning at 0900, you have to be at work. And I'm like, what? Never even thought about it. So I come home, see my wife, my whole neighborhood, because I live in a, a very wonderful neighborhood. My whole, all my neighbors are here watching me. Um, the clothes I had on went in the garbage. I mean, my um, tidy whitey um, under, underwear, my T-shirt and underpants were... Uh, the color of uh, wood, they were brown from the dirt and dust down there. So again, I go into survival mode and I start going through all of this stuff. Um, I go through um, all of the things that I have to do. I am working 24 hours on and that day, this, the day after September 12th, I um, manned a rig from New Jersey. I think it was Flemington, New Jersey, somewhere way down out. I, and they were in 231's response area on an area that's all projects and everything else. And they didn't have any communication. So I had to, the truck had to come on us on every run with us. And we had to teach these guys what they were going to do if we had a fire with a standpipe building because they had never hooked up to a standpipe. So we went through all of this stuff with these guys. The company came back. They had enough manpower to put the company in. They sent the guys from New Jersey home. And I had nothing to do. So I called the division. What do you want me to do? Hang tight. We'll figure it out. And then the chief in that firehouse in the 4-4 battalion was responding to the um, World Trade Center. Go down to the Trade Center. So he said, come with me. And I said, okay, great. So we went down there about two o'clock that afternoon. And we were down there on the 12th until probably seven o'clock the next morning. Chief was a little older than I was at the time. And again, I was in my um, early 50s. Um, well, late 40s, I guess it was, late 40s. And um, the chief and I, the aide was a nice young man. And he says, hey, Cap, you stay with the chief and I'll go get the rig and come down and pick you guys up. And I was like, thank you, God, because we had been on our feet for like 16, 17 hours. And I was like, OK, thank you. Great. We went back to the firehouse and the chief looked at me and said, listen, you can go home. There's not a bed for you in the firehouse because there are so many guys here sleeping. Go home. If I need you, I'll call you. OK, so I went home. I called in the next day. Okay, where do you need me tomorrow? And they said, we need you here. And I had another spot that I was going to be in for 24 hours in a company. And I did that for about a week, 10 days. And then they said they were going to be going to a different shift than we normally worked and go to ABC. And you were going to be doing something. So I was assigned to the World Trade Center Task Force. We were working 12 hour tours um four days in a row and you were working either nights or days if you were working days you started at 6 a.m so you could hopefully get there by 8 a.m 
we leave the other crew, they get back off at 10 o'clock. And then the night shift would come in at like eight o'clock at night. So you were just working around the clock. And it got to the point where, you know, it takes its toll. I mean, I fell asleep at a traffic light coming home one morning. And a guy, one of the nicest people, and I wish I knew who it was. I'm sitting at the light and I fell asleep, foot on the brake, waiting to make a left turn. Guy comes up and he looks at me, he says, are you okay? I said, oh shit, did I fall asleep? I'm sorry. He goes, where are you going? I said, I'm going home. I'm going to sleep. He says, you're in no shape to drive. Slide over. I was in my pickup truck. He says, get over on the other side. He says, my wife's behind us. She'll follow us. I'll drive you home. And I was like, you sure? And he goes, no problem at all. And the guy drove me home. It was probably two and a half miles out of his way. And he drove me home. An act of charity that I still remember. So we were going through all of this stuff. Um, things happened. And um, I mean, one day I had four funerals, the same day, four people I worked with. Whose funeral do I go to? And my wife, again, was my biggest supporter and was the best thing that ever happened to me. And she said, you gotta go to whoever's family is gonna need you the most. And I was like, all right, good idea. That's what I'm going to do. So that's what I did. And I went to the funeral I had to go to. But I was still torn about missing the other three. You know? Uh, and, you know, you can't do it all. But we're firemen. We want to do it all. So keeps on going on. Funerals. Work. 24. Then we go to the ABC chart. We were at AB for a while. 24 on, 24 off. Then we go to ABC. And I'm still working at the recovery and I'm doing some stuff. And then I'm, they're taking me off and putting me back in fire companies, covering for guys who are not gonna come back. And um, around a little before Thanksgiving, probably um, mid-November, um, one day my daughter who's six years old, who I love dearly comes up to me and says, daddy, why are you always mad? And I look at my wife and she says, the kids are afraid of you, honey. You're going, you're going crazy. You're angry. You're mad all the time. She says, you drink it too much. She says, you know, you get up to get a beer, you get two beers. So you don't have to get back up in five minutes to get a second one. She goes, it's not good. So that punch from my six-year-old daughter was the hardest hit I've ever taken in my life. And I ended up saying, okay, I'm gonna to talk to somebody. So I had to get help. So I contacted the FDNY counseling unit, which um, really, I hate to say it, but the, our counseling unit is a roadmap of what should be. And it came about because of this. So is our ceremonial unit. Our ceremonial unit that does funerals. I mean, they are, the best in the business because they've done it so often. But I go to the counseling unit and I tell this to everybody. The first person they sent me to, hang on one. The first person they sent me to was um, a young lady who was my niece's age. And she was just out of college and she was a therapist. And I looked at her and I said, I'm sorry. There's no way I can open up to you. I just can't do it. And she says, I understand that. I understand that. And she goes, I don't know what you've been through. So please try somebody else. And I said, okay. And they hooked me up with a second counselor and it was an older uh, female, but she had a voice that was squeaky and she talked like this. And it was like fingernails on a chalkboard to me. And I said, I'm sorry, this is not gonna work. And she, she was also very pleasant, very nice, very professional. She said, that's not a problem. It's nothing personal, don't, don't even worry about it. And my third counselor turned out to be a retired New York City cop who had walked in the same neighborhoods that I had been in who had done things in certain areas I had been. So he said, we had been on the same sidewalks. We had been in the same places. And he had been shot once and stabbed twice. So we clicked. 
uh, my wife used to call him my boyfriend. And she'd go, hey, you're getting a little cranky. When are you going to see your boyfriend? I said, oh, I got an experience. I got a, an appointment this week. Oh, good, good. And I went and I went through all the treatment steps and everything else. And it dramatically changed my life. It helped me. And I think that we in the fire service have to get better at doing this. Um, one of the people who was killed on 9-11 was Father Judge, who was just one of the people that I loved. And um, he used to come by the firehouse all the time and talk to the guys, stop in and see people and everything else. And he was just a great, great guy. And you have to develop relationships with some of these people who come in. We now have peer counselors stop in firehouses after bad fires just to see what's going on to talk to the guys, leave a card around. So maybe a guy takes a card on the sly, puts it in his pocket because he doesn't want anybody to know that he's going to talk to him. But again, the problem is this counseling, this therapy saved, probably saved my life, saved my marriage, saved my family. I mean, I just went out to lunch yesterday with both my daughters, one of my daughter's friends from Virginia who was up here to see where we live. Um, and my wife, and we just had a great day. And it's a great thing. So it's just something you have to be willing to go do this for the betterment of yourself, to deal with these stresses. And you know, you don't know what the what the cause can be, and you don't know what the levels are, what people get to. Um, it could be a car accident when your kids aren't home yet and the car looks like your car. It could be children. Uh, it could be a child abuse case. I mean, I had a couple of those that were horrible. I mean, whatever it is, and you hit that level and you have to be willing to go out there. Now, we as a fire service have to erase the stigma that you know, you're know you weak, you're a sissy. Listen, not for nothing, I'm nobody special. I worked with a lot of special people. I get trained by a lot of special people, but there are there is nothing wrong with needing someone to talk to. And I mean, I know the firehouse has the gallows humor and we have joked about some of the stuff, you know, and I have been guilty of it too, but it's not, it, and I don't say guilty in a bad way. I have done it because that's how we dealt with it. If I didn't laugh, I would cry. So you have to be willing to do this. You have to look at your people. You have to know what's going on. You have to know your people's family members and have to know what's going on. And it's important that we understand that there is a threshold and everybody's threshold is different and everybody's triggers are different, whether it's kids, whether it's whatever, um, abuse, whatever it is, there are things that we see that people should not see. So we have to be willing to get our people to talk to them, to sit down and to normalize this, to normalize the need to talk to somebody, to bring somebody into the firehouse, to talk to the brothers and sisters. And I think that's one of the biggest things we have to do as a fire service. Incredibly said, Mike. I love being able to just tame you to Mike and let you go. And just to sit back and listen and take it all in. It's, it's just absolutely tremendous. And I can't wait to see you here in a few months. You know, when I think of you, I mean, you are just, you are salt. <laughs> you are seasoned. You are old school. But you really have a new school attitude when it comes to this. And, and I appreciate that so much. You know, being able to speak about this stuff openly is huge. It's, and it's not something that, I mean, I started way after you, but it was still, that stigma was still there until just recently. And it's people like you that are going out and talking about this and sharing your experiences that are changing that, you know, for the, the individuals that have already been through it, it's still going to be helpful. And for the new crop of recruits, they're going to know from the start what these signs and symptoms are and take care of them before they become that big of a problem. Absolutely. And, you know, th the other thing is, I just had a guy I worked with when I was a lieutenant, he was a fireman. 
and he became a lieutenant and he just uh, killed himself. And, you know, he's been retired for, for a couple of years and he killed himself. And it's just it, we, too many of our brothers and sisters are doing this. And there's no reason for that to be happening. You know, you, you can't make suicide a viable option. You can't because the people who love you, the hurt you are doing to them is incredible. And I mean, if you were in your right state of mind, you would never want to hurt the people you love. So, and I know that, you know, you're not in the right state of mind, but, and I've never been that dark. I've been dark, but I've never been that dark. But to normalize that, to make that almost acceptable, shame on us, shame on us. Okay, we should make it better. We should make it more that there is help out there. I mean, how many people in our careers have burnt themselves out, destroyed their lives because of alcohol or drug abuse, where they are self-medicating? You know, think about the numbers. Think about the people. Oh, wow. Did that, um, did that happen to, you know, Joe? that happened to Lizzie? Did that happen to Addison? You know, wow. You know, I never saw it. I didn't see it. I didn't understand it. Okay. And I have seen some guys in my career who, um, you know, um, therapy, um, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, brought them back to productive members of the fraternity productive members of the sorority, productive members of the service. And we have to make that okay. You know, I mean, listen, I still go out every once in a while. Oh, let me buy you a drink. Uh, you know, I'll have a cranberry and club soda. You don't want any alcohol? No, I don't want any alcohol. You know, I'm not going to get into that. But very honestly, for me, I mean, the thing now for me with the alcohol is I don't sleep well when I drink. So, I would rather sleep because that's when I heal and I feel better when I wake up in the morning. So that's, it's vital to me, but we have to understand these things and we have to get better at it. And that's on all of us who are out there who are, have these platforms to talk about it and make it a part of our daily thing. Um, meditation, um, taking time every day, just to thank God. If you believe in God, um, Thank the, your lucky stars. I don't care if you thank the grasshoppers, but sit down and reflect and look at your blessings and look at what you have in your life and be thankful for those and be mindful for what's going on and how you are doing and keeping an eye on yourself. And I mean, it's just so important that all of us do this. It sounds like <clears throat> in a way you're, you're doing a talk about you know what you would do differently if you knew everything you know now when you started oh yeah i would have probably got help a lot earlier you know after some of these fires i mean the guys in the firehouse i mean um again gallows humor um the we had the old inner tube bands to hold the hip flashlights on the garrity lights back then and they they took white out with the little brush and put skulls and crossbones on my helmet. At one point I had 12 on my helmet in two weeks. You know, that's a lot of, you know, do I want to go to work? Do I want to kill somebody else? You know, so you have to think about these things and you have to say, you know, maybe we, um, we need to give this guy a break. Maybe we need to give this guy somebody to talk to, you know, and there are tons of things that have happened in my career. I mean, I've been to amazing runs. I don't know why. Um, I ended up being at both World Trade Centers, at the biggest fire, uh, the Hotel St. George in New York City that went to 18 alarms. Uh, but I was there. So, I mean, just different things that, um, you know, uh, interesting things in my career. And you look at all of these and say, you know, would I have done things differently? Absolutely. Absolutely. 
would I have changed things? Absolutely. Um, what did uh, Mickey Mantle say towards the end of his life? If I knew I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. That's spoken like a true New Yorker. Yeah, you know. <laughs> um, but it's true. It is you know? true. You know, take care of yourself. Uh, I can't do the finger stuff with the, the Star Trek, um, but I'm trying, but I can't do it. But yeah. <laughs> oh, I think yeah. I'm throwing up the... <laughs> there yeah. we go. Yeah, whatever. Live long and prosper, right? But that's what our retirement should be. That's what our life should be after the fire service, where you live long and prosper with the people you love, whether you have kids, grandkids, friends, travel. You know, you want to do this. You do not want to be someone who can't breathe because you're not wearing your air pack. You don't want to be someone who has cancer because you're not taking care of yourself. Um, and again, all of this is part of it. I mean, listen, the colonoscopies, they're no fun, but I have them done every three years is what they tell me I need now. So I have them done. I also have the endoscopy done because of the stuff, the dust from 9-11, but taking care of yourself so you can live longer is, and it's not just physical, it's mental, it's mental. And, you know, doing things to keep yourself alert and alive. Um, you know, whether you read books, play games, go play cards with the guys and girls, whatever. I mean, I go a couple of times a week to a, a group I call Romeo. It's retired old men eating out. We go have coffee together and we just sit down and there are a couple of girls in there. We just call it Romeo because it rhymes. OK, but we go there and we have a couple of females and we sit down and we just have talk and we tell stories and we interact and we we solve the world's problems twice a week and go back the next time and solve them all over again. But being active, being involved, getting out, and that's all part of being a better individual. And you're a better fireman if you take care of your mental and physical health. Very nicely said. And so true. So true. Well, I really want to appreciate you for uh, jumping on and, no and sharing this with uh, all of our listeners and viewers. Um, I'm looking forward for you being live and in, in my city for a change, you know, up October, can I look it up? 26th through 28th. Yep. And Beaver Creek, Ohio, the brothers helping brothers. You can look that up online. That's my shameless plug. Um, but I've got you and uh, just amazing lineup of storytellers and, and members that have, you know, been through a lot of stuff and came out on the other side and want to share just like you did today, their experiences and what, what went wrong and what went right. Most importantly. Yep. Yep. So. And I, I appreciate it. I look forward to seeing you. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, talk soon. And listen, to the brothers and sisters out there, it is not hopeless. Um, if you're going through something, um, there is a, uh, the new um, suicide uh, prevention is 899, I think, or 811. 988. 988. I'm sorry, 988. But there's also... Um, the first responders, if you look it up, the first responders for cops and firemen, Rose Grants and Florian, they're out there for folks like us, okay? And that's what you got to do. You got to get out there and find like people who are willing to talk and get you through this. And units and counseling through your job, whatever else. And listen, if anybody says anything to you, this is my statement that I always said to people. You know what? You're right. I had to go talk to somebody, but you're still an asshole. Okay. And that's all there is to it, you know, because you are taking care of you and the people you love, your family. And that is the most important thing. You getting back, you getting better, and you taking care of you for the people who love you. That's a great way of ending it, but I don't want to end it that way because I actually, I do want to build on to something you said earlier. Okay. But I do think it's important to note, it took you three tries to find somebody that was compatible with you 
when you were seeking help. Yep. You no, know, yep. if, if you try and you reach out to somebody and it's, and there's not, there's a compatibility, compatibility issue. That's okay. Yeah. Find, keep going until you find somebody that does work for you. You know, for you, you need to find somebody else who's lived a similar experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know? And but and once, once you found your boyfriend, as your yeah. wife would say, yeah, it helped you out tremendously. tremendously. It helped your family out, your workout. I mean, everything. So yeah. yep. don't give up. It's for us, you know, as a uh, occupation, a lot of times we have to get near rock bottom before we do reach out. Yep. And so a lot of times it seems like you only have, like when you reach out, it's already really bad, but just don't, don't give up, find that certain individual or that program that works for you. Yeah. Yeah. And very honestly, there's a lot for our services for uh, first responders, police, fire, um, uh, military, et cetera. Find one that works for you. Find one that's good for you and do it. Yeah. So Mike, again, thank you. I'm looking no forward problem. to seeing you in a few months. He's Mike Dugan. I'm Jim Bernica. And we're out of time. Live long and prosper. There you go. Live long and prosper. I can't <laughs> He's kind of got it. <laughs> but it'll work. It'll work. All right. Thank you, you all. sir. Thank you.